All right, I am very pleased today to welcome Leonie Overbeek, a former Cotisol member and presenter. If you've ever been to a Cotisol conference, at least in the past decade or so, uh, you probably remember Leonie. And uh, she's joining us today from her small holding in Bulgaria. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, if you sort of look behind me uh, and out to the sides, wow. uh, you can see where I am. I'm, I'm sitting on my garden swing, enjoying a light breeze and a beautiful October day. So <laughs> absolutely oh, gorgeous. Now, how long have you actually been living in Bulgaria now? It's been over a year, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I moved here on uh, in January uh, 2019. Okay. So this is my second year uh, here and also my second year, of course, at Sofia University. And uh, oh, it's just been great. It's, it's wonderful. Um, love it. Love it. <laughs> So do you want to actually get started with uh, Bulgaria and your small holding and uh, what you've sure. been doing there? Or do you want to start with ELT and how you got involved in language teaching? Um, I think let's, let's start with the, the newest and okay. work back to the oldest. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> so basically, um, how I came to be in Bulgaria is that uh, I was looking around for some place, first of all, that I could uh, settle into for retirement. Secondly, where I could practice my newest passion, uh, which is all about gardening and permaculture and the ecology and uh, the philosophy of sustainable living and stuff like that. And um, looking into all the various options, Bulgaria offered the best. First of all, because property here is very, very, very reasonably priced. Um, I got my little small holding, which is just under an acre oh, wow. um, for uh, the equivalent of 10,000, 10, 10 million won. Oh, wow. So 10 million wow, won. Wow, that's uh, really nice. Uh, you know, it's, it's like two and a half months salary. Mm -hmm. Basically bought this place free and clear, no mortgages, no encumbrances, nothing whatsoever. Um, it's was in very good condition uh, in terms of the structure of the house. Um, and when I bought it back in 2017, um, my friend Matthew Love actually helped me to do that. You might remember Matthew, he was also a Cotisol member. And he, of course, is now here in Bulgaria as well, living on his small holding in a little village near Veliko Tarnova, which is about, um, sorry, Targoviste. He's working in Veliko Tarnova at the moment. Um, it's about 45 minutes drive away from me. Okay. So uh, we're into the same thing at the moment. <laughs> and the idea basically is that uh, the PhD I'm doing is all in environmental ethics, the philosophy of environmental um, ethics, the sustainability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I don't want to just be an academic about it. I want to actually try and live it out, um, which is how the whole thing, uh, you know, came about. In terms of Sofia University, I did 18 months of coursework, um, which introduced me to a field that I had 
dabbled in, but never really driven, you know, dove into off the deep end kind of thing. And uh, so uh, it was a little bit of a stretch for me, academically speaking. Uh, but that was what was great about it. I had to get my brain into top gear again and um, uh, passed all the coursework exams with uh, quite reasonable marks. <laughs> <laughs> and at the moment, I'm busy preparing for uh, submitting my actual research proposal, which is going to be looking at uh, Derrida, uh, who is, of course, one of the contemporary philosophers, and his book on the relationship between man and nature. Oh, interesting. Yes. So um, I'm going to be exploring, first of all, all of his ideas, um, then where they, what foundations he built those ideas on, and how applicable they are to our current situation. So that's, that's the idea. So that's, that's where we are now. Um, so that's the newest uh, stuff. In terms of what the small holding has yielded, um, I've got this beautiful grapevine. Uh, so I don't know if you can see oh, yeah. over there. And uh, it actually yielded enough grapes to start my own winemaking. Uh, <laughs> that is amazing. Activity. So at the moment in my cellar, there is a vat of grapes happily fermenting away, hopefully to wine and not to vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, vinegar is nice too, depending on what you want to do with it. Right? Exactly. Red wine we'll vinegar it. is also good. <laughs> so whichever way it goes, I'm going to be happy. Oh, that's fantastic. Now I've got, I've got so many questions for you about, okay. about what you're doing and, and, and how you got there. And, and first, um, I'm, I'm a city girl. Yeah, I yeah. am not completely sure what a small holding is. I can okay. guess, but um, could you give me a, an actual definition? Okay, a small holding um, is usually anything between half an acre and 10 acres of land. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, that is considered a small holding. So it is something that can be worked by one or two people, maybe a family, um, where the uh, labor intensity is not as great as a big farm. Mm, okay. uh, the idea is that you will be producing mainly food for yourself um, to sustain you and your family and what whoever else works on the land with you. Um, not more than that. And if you do have a surplus, uh, you will bottle it, can it, pickle it, preserve it in some way for the lean times. Okay. Some small holdings do go into an economic situation where they uh, tend to then do something artisanal, mm. like making artisanal goat's cheese or, um, oh. you know, uh, pickling berries or you know something like that so uh, but it will not be a huge economic unit mm -hmm. in terms of agriculture it's a single family sustainable unit um, farms of course uh, where I am here I'm actually surrounded by uh, sunflower and corn farms. Oh, wow. 
So my neighbors across the road work for the big agricultural combine that runs this area. Um, so yes, every now and then the big farm machinery comes rumbling past my house. And of course, it's, it's very nice to be in a situation like this because it means that when I do need, say, one of my fields mown or uh, cleaned up or so on, I can call in uh, their help and it's done in a trice. That's so so nice. that's very nice. Are you planning to do any uh, anything with selling the the wine you're making or or anything that you I know you're a baker as well are you are you making any artisanal things to sell well at at this stage I'm pretty much still in the development process okay um my significant other who I met here in Bulgaria oh wow uh he and I have ideas for this place, uh, which will involve as a byproduct some beautiful honey. Oh, really? And yes, yes. Um, oh. And uh, we will be having um, something that I can't quite reveal at the moment because we have to first get everything registered and uh, cleared out and, and so on. But uh, watch out, in another year or so, you'll be getting invitations to come and experience life here on a Bulgarian small holding. Uh, enjoy the yogurt, enjoy the honey, uh, learn how to bake some sourdough bread, uh, do some painting courses, things like that. That sounds amazing. You're making an artist's retreat, basically, aren't you? <laughs> an artist's Pretty much. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, well, sort of the people who are creative mm. in various ways. Uh, so I'm not limiting it only to artists. I want to have people who are into nature, who are into creativity, who are interested in exploring the philosophy of it and the practicality of it. That's, that's the idea. All right. So my question for you is how on earth did you learn how to do all of these things? How do you know how to make your own wine and, and, and raise bees for honey? Cause that's just mind blowing. <laughs> Uh, in a way, you know how to do, you know, <laughs> in a way, uh, this goes back to my childhood in South Africa. Okay. My family are all very, 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 very long lived. And I was fortunate enough to actually have clear memories hmm. of all of my great grandparents. Oh, wow. All of them, all eight great grandparents. I can remember them. And all of them were either small holding or farming people. Oh, wow. um, my great great grandmother, uh, Westhazen, for example, had a small holding next to one of South Africa's dams, the Hartebeer's Poor Dam, mm. where she raised ducks and turkeys and chickens and. Um, there were regular visits to her place and, you know, you learn how to kill and pluck a chicken and uh, <laughs> prepare course. it for the pot and, and then things like that. Uh, up to my great-great-grandfather, Nell, uh, who had a huge corn and dairy farm uh, out near Delmas and where I used to spend uh, summer holidays. Wow. Learning how to churn milk, make cheese, uh, things like that. So yeah, it's, it's my childhood now come full circle. Well, they didn't uh, teach you so how to speak. make wine though, did they? <laughs> ah, but you see, that's where my reading comes in. <laughs> so you're self-taught. And the fact. And the fact 
that I worked for 15 years at Stellenbosch University, which is in the heart of South Africa's wine country. Oh, wow. And if you don't learn a little bit about winemaking while you're there, you are going around with your eyes blinkered. Oh, <laughs> and sure. I did not. Oh, so, fine. yeah. Are you going to be making <laughs> cheese as well? I'm hoping to. I'm hoping to. Um, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. My main uh, thing that I do want to do next is um, at the end of autumn, I'm in a club that will slaughter a pig. Mm. And I will get one of the legs and shoulder and some ribs. And I'm going to be making bacon and jamon. Oh, wow. So I will be hanging the bacon and the jamon down in my cellar and seeing how that develops. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> That's amazing, Leo. Oh. I mean, you were multi-talented when I knew you here in Korea. It sounds like you're just <laughs> open to pretty much everything and, and mastering it so quickly. <laughs> Thank, That's you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm curious also for people who are looking at retiring in another country, um, mm -hmm. or even retiring in Bulgaria, what kind of yes. visa issues did you encounter as you were trying to actually move there? The easiest uh, way of getting a visa for Bulgaria is to have some kind of a pension uh, that you can they pay into a Bulgarian bank account. Uh, okay. So if you have a, a pension from, say, South Africa or South Korea or a university or something like that, um, it's a doddle. Mm -hmm. The problem was that I don't have any of those things. So for me, the process was a little bit more difficult. Um, there are two other uh, sort of main options. One is there was getting my uh, previous qualifications but once they've Bulgarian university uh, being allowed to study there um, it's a very very easy process and I have to say Sophia University and the people at the Department of Philosophy have been so helpful so great so fantastic it's been amazing it's been amazing uh, for people, of course, of British origin, for up until the end of December, it's fairly easy moving in and out of Bulgaria. But with Brexit, that's, they're now going to have to go through the visa application process like the rest of us. Uh, the other option is to actually be a freelance business owner mm. of some kind mm -hmm. bringing work into Bulgaria and to do that you have to then actually meet with the Bulgarian Ministry of Labor mm. and present your case as to why this is a good uh, job creation situation um, and why you know you should be granted a long-term visa on the strength of that um, if all things come together the, the way they should then next year I will be going that route um, because by then we will have things up and running here and we will be able to show some profit and we will be able to show some job creation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think things will be great. So that's very cool. Yeah. 
Nice. And have you encountered any uh, language or cultural barriers that have kind of uh, made a hiccup in your studies or settling there? Bulgarians are very much bilingual when it comes, or, or even trilingual or multilingual. Um, many of them can speak rudimentary English, if I can put it like that. Uh, but I would say about half the population um, is at a lower intermediate level in terms of English speaking. So I haven't encountered any problems with that. Um, the places where there are perhaps a little bit more difficulty is when it's the contractual side, when the contract is presented to you only in Bulgarian. That's when it helps to have some kind of a translator with you to explain to you exactly what it is you're signing um, and to just sort out the finer details. Um, so no hiccups on, on that side. And of course, my German is coming back to me because many people, when uh, you say Nyama Bulgarski, which is I do not speak Bulgarian, uh, then the next question inevitably is Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Oh. And uh -huh. I was quite fluent in German at one time, so I'm then able to use that. That's very cool. Are you taking uh, lessons in, in Bulgarian? Or not yet? Uh, or not really? <laughs> no, no, simply because I just don't have the time at the moment. I would be amazed uh, if you did, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> But I do have some phrases that, that are, you know, pretty much regular mm -hmm. um, that I can use to initiate conversations. Oh, that's very cool. And I'm curious, uh, in your coursework at the university, what kind of courses does one take if one is majoring in environmental philosophy? Ah, well, uh, First of all, the, the first six months were basically focusing on things like epistemology, um, ethics, um, the history of uh, Western uh, and European philosophy, um, the, uh, oh, what was the other one? Um, we could choose to either do the philosophy of aesthetics, that was a, um, an elective, or the philosophy of art. And okay. yeah, and I decided to do the philosophy of art, which was very interesting. So the aesthetics and art are, are sort of related but aesthetics was just a little bit of a wider field, whereas art honed in a little bit on actual creation of art. Uh, then during the second semester, uh, we did actual philosophers, people like Gadamer, Kant, um, Levinas, um, and what their philosophies were and what they bring to uh, the environmental uh, philosophy debate. And then in the third semester, uh, we were given a list of 25 questions that could be posed to us as topics. Mm -hmm. And we have basically go and prepare to answer those. So things like what is the difference between applied ethics and um, or normative ethics um, and uh, inductive reasoning and, and things like that. Um, so pretty much to show that you have the language of philosophy. 
in order to then speak about environmental philosophy. So you're not doing specifically environmental philosophy as such. That now comes in with the the thesis that you're going to be doing and the guidance you will receive from your mentor. Oh, very interesting. So if you had to, if you were to recommend one reading as an introductory reading for people who are curious about this field, what would you suggest that people start with? I would say go and read the work that um, uh, Hans George Gadamer did on utilitarian ethics. Okay. Because it doesn't just cover the uh, actual uh, environmental ethics. It covers things like medicine. It covers things like education. It covers a wide range. And he is a very, very easy person to read. Oh, interesting. Okay. So uh, he's, a, he's a nice introduction to that. Um, I would also suggest that you just look at the work of somebody like Simone de Beauvoir oh, interesting. and Kristeva, Julia Kristeva. Okay, um, I know Kristeva well. Yeah, uh, where they talk about the um, power relationships and power structures and things like that. So those are people I could commend. Oh, well, that's interesting. Now, as uh, you said, you took uh, the philosophy of art and you yourself are an artist in many, many uh, different forms from yes. acting to directing to singing <laughs> to painting and writing and I mean, I would say yeah. even making wine and baking are forms of artistry <laughs> as well, definitely. Absolutely. There's an art, there's an art to both of those things. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. So um, I think I've got art in my blood. My um, dad's older brother was a painter and a musician. Oh, really? And my mom's youngest sister uh, does pottery. Oh wow! So <laughs> it seems to it seems to run in the family. Oh, it sure does. But but your career pre English language teaching was in the hard sciences. Exactly. Right? And those exactly. those seem kind of um, <laughs> they don't really match they, 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 in my imagination. Uh, <laughs> but well, uh, I was actually talking last evening to my students. I'm. I'm teaching an online conversation class for a company here in Bulgaria, Kabinata. And uh, I have such an interesting bunch of students. And we were talking about this whole thing of you are either, you know, an artistic person or you're a science person. And of course, that's one of the neuro myths mm -hmm. that have lately been exploded. This right brain, left brain stuff, sure. you know, um, no. There is no reason why you cannot be both. I because science we, means creativity, right? Exactly. All, all of the human activities we are involved in needs creativity of some kind or another. Um, problem solving is creativity. Uh, I know many people don't think of it that way, but it really is because you have to take uh, a leap into the unknown and come up with a solution that maybe hasn't been seen before and you have to try it out and that is what a lot of art also is you put a brush to canvas and uh especially if you're doing watercolors the flow of the water the flow of the pigment the uh, roughness of the paper all of those things are going to 
influence the stroke that you are making and how that stroke will actually look when it's finished. Um, so there's, there's this interplay of, of things mm -hmm. and where you explore. And that I think is the big thing. If you're an explorer, then you are like me. Everything is grist to your mill. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, so. see, I can see where that kind of interconnected uh, ideology, that idea can, and that creativity also probably played into your English language teaching when you were here in Korea. Absolutely. And, and now too, now that you're doing it online. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because language for me, and, and now we're going into the language teaching. So um, going back to how I first got started in, in language teaching. Uh, there was a period um, in my life where I nearly died. Um, I, in 2002, I went down with what was then finally diagnosed as a pulmonary embolism. Oh, wow. And uh, basically spent um, 10 days in the ICU and then um, another month in hospital before they finally were prepared to release me. And during that time, I had to, you know, I, I think anyone who has a near-death experience uh, sort of take stock of where they are and what they've done and how they've reached the point where they, they've reached. And I thought, what? is there in life that I still want to do? Um, what would I have regretted not doing if I had died? And one of the answers was not exploring my love of language. And that's when I decided, okay, here I come, language teaching because it would also then offer a way for me to do the other thing I would have regretted, and that is to not have traveled to the East. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to explore the Orient, <laughs> and this would then give me the opportunity to do that. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I ended up in South Korea as an English teacher. And why Korea say, in particular? They were the first ones who said, yes, we've got a job for you. I sent out applications into China and Japan and South Korea. And they were the first ones who said, yes, we've got a job for you. And very importantly, your daughter as well. Mm. Oh, that because was, that, that was at the time that was crucial that she and I would be going into the same general place um, and uh, yeah so South Korea was the ones that opened the door and I'm very glad they did because I had a blast there the 12 years I spent there were fantastic oh, that's and great. I do not regret it that's very cool well I mean it sounds like a lot of your life has uh, really woven together very well. So I'm wondering, have you found any, I don't know, common strands between teaching all of these different things that you teach, between teaching English and teaching art, and you were talking about uh, teaching apiculture. Uh, mm. what, what commonalities have you found that you can share with us? Okay, the, the biggest one, I would say, is that when you are teaching anything, it doesn't matter whether you are teaching somebody physics or whether you are teaching them permaculture or whether you're teaching them to bake a loaf of bread. If you are not passionate about whatever it is that you are teaching, mm. your teaching will suck. You will be a bad teacher. That's very true, I think. <laughs> And it sounds so simple. It sounds so simple. But 
I think it's the hardest thing for people to realize is that the great teachers are not people who have an immense amount of theoretical knowledge or an immense amount of insight into something or so on, but they have a passion mm. for that particular subject. And if you have a passion for that subject, you are going to communicate that passion to the people you are teaching. And often as teachers, we are in the process of learning as well. I mean, teaching is not a one-way street. Um, teaching is always a two-way street. Your students will always bring things to you that, I don't know how I can put it, will surprise you, mm. will astonish you, will make you think go, why didn't I think of that? Right. And if you are open to that, that's the other key. That's the other common strand is being open to the idea that even though you are a teacher, you still have a lot to learn. Interesting. So can you tell us a story about a time when that happened to you while you were teaching? Ah, okay. <clears throat> I think um, when I was busy in South Africa, uh, after I had finished my TEFL training, uh, the place where I did that came to me and said, listen, our TEFL trainer is going to leave us. Would you like the job? <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> not that I actually have any experience with TEFL teaching like she had, but if you think I can do the job, oh yes, absolutely. So I started doing that and I had um, two guys in the third course that I taught. Um, one came from a background of the arts, dancing and um, acting and so on. And the other one ha was an actual high school teacher in science. And they were both now doing the TEFL course together in order to go and take up a position in China, teaching mm -hmm. English. And when I saw their sort of resumes, I thought, oh my goodness, here is a trained teacher and not just a teacher, but an English teacher who is going to be sitting in my classroom and I'm going to tell him how to teach English. <laughs> how on earth is this going to work? Right. And then I thought, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is going to work because I'm going to be able to call on him <laughs> for difficult questions that the other students are going to ask me about situations that I have not yet encountered, but that he has encountered. And um, Johan came through with flying colors for me in this. Uh, I remember there was one question that was constantly asked, and I think when we are in, in EFL or ESL teaching, it always gets asked by someone who just is starting in the field. How am I going to communicate with students who cannot speak a word of English? And of course, Johan, being a South African English teacher could answer this because it's a situation that occurs very often in South Africa, what with 11 official languages, that students do come into your class from a Kosa background or a Zulu background or an Afrikaans background, and they can't speak English. And how are you communicating with them? And so 
when the question came, I said, Johan, any uh, stories you can tell? And uh, he said to me, oh, thank you for the chance. It's, it's great because this is something I have experienced. And he told us about how he goes uh, with Afrikaans students into some of the similar words like damn, dumb. Hmm. Just a different pronunciation, but they mean exactly the same thing. They are spelled the same way. And that's the breakthrough moment. He said, but for children who, who have nothing, it's as simple as pointing to something and giving them the name of the thing and just encouraging them to explore this new language. And that was an aha moment for me as well, because I thought, yeah, I hadn't actually thought about that. It is as simple as that, because that's how parents get their children to speak. Mm -hmm. By saying to them, you know, glasses. And there we go. Mm -hmm. So... That was my breakthrough moment in, in that sense. Well, that's very cool. Now, I know uh, I haven't seen you actually teach, but I've participated in a lot of your workshops. And I know <laughs> you've got this amazing presence, like this very, I, I would say it's a stage presence, but that's partly because I do know your theatrical background. So I'm yes. wondering, uh, you have acted, directed, and been in musical theater. Yes. Among those things, which do you prefer? And are you going to go back to them? <laughs> I actually must say I love musical theater the most. Okay. I really do. And one of the things that I have on a back shelf is a one-woman show, Coward and Me, because mm. I love the works of Noel Coward. I really do. And I would love at some future stage when all the rest of the activities here are nicely humming along and I can take a month or so uh, break from them and leave them to just run themselves under the supervision of maybe one or two people to take that to the Edinburgh Festival Ooh. and introduce them to people like Louisa was a movie queen before she had achieved the age of sweet 16 long before Cagney threw those girls about Little Louisa tossed her curls about, you know. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I really hope you can do that in, in the future after this I, whole coronavirus thing passes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I, I would love, love, love to do that. Um, maybe I should even, if, if we do find that the coronavirus hangs around and hangs around and we, mm. you know, we never get back to the time when there will be stage shows and an audience in a live setting. Uh, although I don't think, I think that's a very remote possibility. Mm -hmm. I think it is going to come back. Uh, there's no reason why I couldn't work that up into an online situation. Oh, sure. Oh, that'd so. be interesting. You're welcome yeah. to practice on us here in Korea anytime <laughs> you want to. Just send it to Kotisol. We'll, we'll be happy to give you feedback and enjoy it ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So I do have, I know we're down to the last uh, five minutes or so. So mm -hmm. oh, I've still got so many questions. Uh, okay. <laughs> Two questions to end with. Yes. Uh, yes. The first is you took stock of your life back yeah. in what was it, 2002? You said 2002. 
and you came up with some things that you wanted to try in the near future. Yeah. Now you're in the middle yeah. of a bunch of different new projects right now. So maybe it's yes. not the best time to ask this, but what's on your bucket list now? Ooh, um, bucket list. Let's see. A visit to Istanbul Ooh. because it's just a hop, skip and jump away from me at the moment uh, and there's actually a ferry that goes from Varna port to Istanbul oh, wow. so that is that is bucket list number I, I would say that's number one on the bucket list um, learning to speak Bulgarian number two on the bucket list <laughs> <laughs> that's fair um Number three is, is one of those things which has always sort of been hovering in, in the background and, you know, various things have always intervened and, and not gotten me there. But to get out one of my books into a published form where it's a hardcover oh, wow. uh, paperback and electronic format. I do have a book in electronic format at the moment, but I think I need to get it to that point. So oh, that's, very cool. that's, about, that's about it. Those seem very achievable too. <laughs> I, I, I would say so. <laughs> knowing you, I mean, you just need the time, <laughs> which yeah, I can yeah. imagine you don't have right now. All right, my last, yeah. last question then is, yes? what's, what's the best advice you've ever gotten? This goes back to a gentleman by the name of Kalman Richter, who was a Hungarian refugee. Um, he escaped Hungary, uh, from under the communist regime. And in the process, he saw several of his family members killed. Wow. And yet, when you met him, he was one of the most positive and amazingly open and generous people I have ever met and had the privilege to work with. And one day I asked him, how is it possible that you, that you experience that kind of devastating thing in your life and yet come out the other side still being so positive about life, about people, about the future, about things. I was very young at that time. I, I was 22. And so major life catastrophes had, had not struck me at that time yet. And he said to me, anything that happens to you in life can be regarded as a tragedy or it can be regarded as comedy. If you regard it as a tragedy and you say my life is over because of this, then you are dishonoring not just you, but all the people who led to you, all the people that are in your ancestry, all the people in society around you that sustain you. Of course you can be sad. Of course you can be mourning and remembering the people in your life that are no longer there. But the best thing you can do to honor them and to honor their memory is to move on with your life. And the best way to live life is as a comedy, as something positive, as something great, as something amazing. 
And I always remembered that, and it has stood me in good stead throughout my life. That's really beautiful. I really love that advice. Yes, it's, it, it, it has been, it's been my lodestar, if I can put it like that. And I, I think of Kalman with, with great fondness. He passed away about um, 17, 18 years ago, more or less. But yes, he was definitely one of those angels that drops into your life now and then. And if you heed them, your life is fantastic. I think that is a wonderful note to end on. Unless you have any additional closing thoughts, that seems like a great place to wrap up. I, th I think so. I think so. Leonie, Sean, don't hang up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. but I do want to say uh, thank you so much for talking with us. And thanks That's to everybody pleasure. who's watching for watching. So. Okay, it was a great pleasure. And my apologies again that I was late into the room. No worries. <laughs> Nobody who's watching this later will know that. <laughs> right. Thank you again, Leonie, and thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time for our uh, next AMA. Bye. Bye.